Amen. And I'm excited about what I'm going to preach because I know it is birthed from the Spirit. See, that's what Jesus was all about. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the acceptable year, the year of Lot's favor. Because he said, it is because of who is upon me, what I'm preaching is going to bring acceptance. Amen. It is going to bring favor upon you. You know, it just brings heaven down upon you, is what he's saying. So, I'm excited about what I'm going to preach, and it is going to be exciting for you too. And I'm sure it will be a blessing. So, now tell me, how did you enjoy the two weeks of talking about blessings? I mean, I'm sure it, it was a challenge for me uh, to practice it, to acknowledge it. The first week, we spoke about God's favor. You know, blessing is... Um, it's about being fruitful, the abounding, uh, multiplying, increasing, and all of that. How does it happen? It is a blessing of God. I mean, it is not the multiplication that determines your blessing. It is your blessedness that determines your multiplication, right? It is not the abundance that determines. It is who you are that determines what happens to you. Amen? So, and we spoke about God's favor that brings upon, uh, that carries that, imp that weight behind this word blessing that has its effect upon you. And last week, we, then we spoke about God's grace, right? Grace, the empowering agent that brings upon, that brings a meaning to the word blessing. Then last week, we spoke about righteousness. You know, speaking of righteousness, I just want to establish another a uh, significant point about righteousness. See, righteousness, uh, we read in Matthew, the Bible, I mean, Jesus on the Mount, a Sermon on the Mount, he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and it's righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Right? And many times, when for all these things, we talk about like this, you know, to have the right thing, you need to have faith. Have you heard that? Healing, faith. You want to buy a new car? Faith. You want to have a good job? Faith. You want to see a breakthrough? Faith. If it is not happening, probably your faith is not good enough. Probably your faith is not big enough. Improve your faith. And they talk about seven steps of faith, you know, eight steps of faith, eight steps to your breakthrough and all of that. But then, here it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. It's not the faith that brings all these things to you. It is your righteousness. Amen? So, you need to shift your faith, take it away from wanting to have those things to believing who I am. When you shift your faith, I mean, from here to here, not for things that I have, want to have. You know, my faith shouldn't be about, okay, I'm going to have this. I'm going to, I see, vision a red car. I'm, I'm envisioning a red car. I'm envisioning a Mercedes Benz. You know, it's not about that anymore. Amen? It is about this. I know who I am. Because I know who I am, I know what I'm going to have. Amen? It is because of who I am. So I need to change from, you know, what I want to have to believing who I am. Amen. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? God is simplifying life so much. God wants you to live a simple life. But where are we heading? We are complicating it. Is my faith good enough? Know this. You are made righteous. I mean, the righteous that you could ever be. By default, you're righteous. But my faith should be on that righteousness of mine. You, I mean, when you talk about righteousness, this is what the world is talking about. More, morally, are you righteous? They look at the morality of a person to determine whether they are righteous. Are you doing the right thing to be righteous? No, but the thing is, you are legally righteous. You need to look at righteousness from the legal aspect. My son, no matter what he does, the fact that he's my son never changes. It's legal. That's it. There's no change to that. He can like it. 
or he cannot like it. <laughs> Whether he likes it or not, he is my son. He doesn't have to do it. I mean, he didn't do anything to be my son. Same thing, this righteousness that has been endowed upon me, that has been given to you, that has been imputed upon you, it is a legal right of yours. God wants you to have a legal right with him. That's what this righteousness is all about. It's not about, I'm doing the right thing to be righteous. It is a legal right for you to be righteous. It is, that's, that's the relationship God has established with you through this righteousness. Amen? Isn't it good? It's a good thing to know you're righteous. So don't worry about, I mean, even in the Garden of Eden, you know, when, uh, there are two things. One is a, a tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil, and the other is a tree of life. So which brought in the problem? It's not the tree of life. It's a knowledge of good and evil. See, when you talk about the law, it is also, again, knowledge of good and evil. But when Jesus came, he said, I am the bread of life. I came to give life abundantly. So move away from, am I doing right? Am I being right? Start believing you are right. Start accepting this truth that I am right with God. That is my legal stand with God. And that will impact the way your life runs in this world. It will. You will see it. You will experience it. You will enjoy it. Amen? So let's move on. Blessing. The significance of this word, blessing. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 6. So here this chapter talks about uh, David wanting to bring the ark of God you know, into his city, the city of David. He became the king. He was anointed as a king. He wants it from where it was. It was not where he was. And he wanted it to be moved into his city. So he goes there, he finds the ark, and then he puts it on a bullock cart, and then they are taking it to the city of David. They are all going nuts, you know, sacrificing and worshiping God, dancing before the ark. And as they are going, the ox tumbles. I mean, the animal that's pulling the bullock or the cart it, it just, you know, takes a tumble. And then this ark is about to fall off. And there were these two guys standing by the ark, one man named Uzzah. He puts out his hand to stop it from falling. He thought he will stop the ark from falling. He falls down dead. And suddenly, we pick it up from there. Okay. Uh, read uh, verse 9. We'll read from 8. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord. From being so willing to, so unwilling. He wanted it so much. Suddenly he's saying, I don't want it. <laughs> He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. Ooh. Can you imagine this? Somebody dies and then the reason for the death is brought to your house. Imagine Obed-Edom's plight there. Just now somebody died. And there stands the king saying, Mr. Obed-Edom, this ark will remain in your house. Which ark? The ark because of which someone died. I mean, if that happens to you, do you think you will let that ark come into your house? No. But here, we read the next verse. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite, for three months. It is there for three months. And the effect of the ark being in the house of Obed Edom is this. And the Lord blessed them and his entire household. Now King David was told the Lord has blessed the household of Obed Edom and everything he has because of the ark. So David went down and brought up the ark of. Now there's a turnaround. He's saying, no, I need that back. So what happened there? What is it telling me? What is it telling us is what we're going to talk about. See, when you talk about the ark of God, it talks about God's presence. That's where God's presence manifested, right? 
when God spoke to Moses, when God spoke to Aaron, when God wanted to convey something to the children of Israel, that is where it all began. It is where it all began, right? God's presence. We all know that. I mean, we sing about God's presence. We want God's presence, right? It is where it all happened. When David wanted to go to a battle, he won't go immediately. He will say, bring the ark. Let me inquire. Immediately he will ask, can I go for the battle? Can I go and do this? Yes, God will speak from there. That is where. So what was in the ark? There were three things that, were, that was in the ark. Uh, Hebrews 9.4 says, uh, you can note it down, I will just quote it for you. Hebrews 9.4, we see three things. Number one is, the, is a pot filled with manna, right? Number two is the uh, rod that bl bloomed. Number three, the Ten Commandments, okay? What does that signify? The, manna, the pot filled with manna signifies man's rebellion against God's provision. God wanted him to be there, wanted it to be there. You men, you rebelled. Put it there. Second, the rod that bloomed, it is, uh, I mean, God anointed Aaron as a chief priest, the high priest. Now these guys are getting jealous, you know. Oh, only God can speak through these. Why can't he speak through us? Why can't he do this through us? He will do it. And they are, they, they are ordained by God. And they are rebelling against their authority. They are rebelling against, you know, what they are saying. And God said, let me prove that it is I who sets up a king and who puts down a king. You know, if God sets you up, I want you to know, no one can pull you down from there. If God sets you up in a place, you can say what you want, you can think what you want. If God has set you up there, not even you can bring yourself down. So can you believe, can you imagine what others cannot do for you? Don't fear people. Don't fear what they can think about you. Don't fear what they say about you. Don't fear the opinion because it is God who set you up there and it is God who will defend you. Amen. And God says, place a rod. All the 12 uh, elders of Israel, bring your rod. Let me place it there. Next morning, all those rods remain the same. I mean, there's no life. But Aaron's rod budded. There was... Flower, it was flowering. There were little uh, fruits. It sprung back to life. And God said, put it in the ark. Where? Under God's presence. Man's rebellion <laughs> against God's provision. Men's rebellion against God's authority. Third thing, the Ten Commandments. Man's inability to attain God's standards. It is there. That is, was, that is what was in the ark. And the beauty of it is, God overlooked all of this. And they, we read, uh, is uh, the next verse, above the ark with the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. What was covering? The at I mean, let's simplify it. It's called the mercy seat. It is a mercy seat. See, God's presence in your life should always, it is always based on God's grace. Amen? It is not based on efforts. So David, he wanted to bring it into, you know, into his place according to his efforts. He said, I want it there. And if he wanted it there, he should have done according to as it is written. They are not supposed to put it on a bullock cart. The, the priest, the Levites are supposed to carry the ark. He missed it. See, many times we think we can do it to bring God down. Right? No, it doesn't work like that. Oh, but you know, poor guy, you know, uh, sitting in a corner, knows nothing about the ark. I don't know who he is. You know, some people say he's a Gittite. That means he's a Gentile who came along with David into uh, Israel. Some people call him, they come from a, a town called Gittite in Philistine. So he is the most unworthiest person to host the ark of God. 
but he has the ark of God, which signifies God's presence, which overlooks man's rebellion, man's, you know, uh, misdeeds, everything. It is there in his house. That is what grace is all about. See, God, you can attain God's presence in only one way. That is only through grace. And when you attain only through grace, the impact of it is higher. Because it is a free will. It is his free choice. He said, I'm going to do something in that house. And that's what happened to Obed Adam's house. There was a change. How many of you are believing for a change? I am. I want a change. I want things to change around me. I want things to change in me. I want, to, I want change to happen here. I want so many things to change. And those changes will happen through grace. I mean, you can work for it. You can do so many things, but it will have only so much effect. But when you involve God and allow His grace to work, it changes so much that people, king like David, or people around you will sit up and take notice and say, there is something in the house that is bringing about a change. It is nothing but God's grace. Amen. Obed Edom. Nobody knew anything about him. He, the, uh, uh, the, you know, a privilege to host. I mean, they so, host a mission of death, you can call it. <laughs> Someone died because of the ark. And it is in his house. Can you imagine the plight of that man for the first week? Living in fear. Who's going to die next? What should I do with it? How do I handle this? I'm sure you would have given up. Let it be there. Let it be there. That's how you deal with grace. Don't worry about, you know, you. Let grace do its work upon your life. Don't worry about you. How do I do this? Am I right with God? No, you need to come to this place, start believing. My righteousness, my legal rights with God. It will have its work in your life. And that work is, I mean, how did people know Obed Edom is blessed? I'm sure things would have changed. Yeah, things would have changed around him. His house will look so vibrant. There will be happiness in his house. There will be joy in his house. It is so healthy. People in his house is healthy. Somebody walks into his house with sickness and next minute they walk out with healing happening. They say there is something in that house. That is grace. Amen. Now, I want to ask you a question. Are we under the Ark of the Covenant or under Jesus? See, for them it is the Ark that made the difference. Okay, but for you and me, it is Jesus. Jesus is a typology of the Ark of the Covenant. He said, I am the manna that came from heaven. He is a provision for you and me. Amen. So when he is a provision, let go of your efforts. He is your provision. And second thing, he is a firstborn from the dead. He is a firstborn from the dead. I mean, a dead just like how a dead rod bloomed back to life. Same way, Jesus, who died, who was in the grave for three days, nothing in him, no life in him, came back to life. He is a rod that bloomed for you and me. And Jesus said, I have come to fulfill the law. He kept the, he kept the law for you and me so that you and I would be like who have, kept the right, who have fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law. Now we are under Jesus. Amen. And it is He. We are in Him now. Okay. For them, they had to have the ark. They were living around the ark. But for you and me, you are living in the ark. So if you fall, you fall in the ark. I mean, people used to say, you know, the, uh, the Noah's ark, it was rocked. You know, it was swayed here and there, tossed high up the mountains into, you know, all the rush of the wind and the sea and everything. But the thing is, everyone who slipped by the swaying of the boat would have slipped inside. Nobody fell off the boat. That is your situation 
in Jesus Christ. You might fail, you might fall, you might come short of God's expectations, but everything happens in Jesus Christ. He has got you covered. You need to, I need to, we need to understand it. We need to accept it. Amen? So you and I are in the ark. And what covers us? It is grace. Amen? Totally under grace. Oh, yeah. Mercy seat. So what is shadowing you and me now? Jesus. So now your life will have the effect of Jesus. I'm, and I'm going to show you, you know, uh, how, I mean, what are these changes that has happened to you that can in turn be a blessing to you? Uh, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, 4, and 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Who are we now? We are blessed in the... I mean, why shouldn't he bless me here? Why should he bless me in the heavenly realms? I mean, I would rather have, you know, an unending bank account, bank balance. I would rather have, you know, good health. I would rather have a big house, an obedient wife. <laughs> Just as she's away. I need to get back home. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my own church building <laughs> have thousands of people coming to listen to what we preach and teach. Her. But he's saying, no, I will bless. I mean, the blessing that we have is in the heaven. What is he telling us? He's saying, listen, enough of determining how blessed you are by what you have. That's what it is. Enough of determining how blessed you are by what you have. Isn't that what the world is after? What we eat, what we drink, you know, what we clothe ourselves, where we live, how we go. This is what, I mean, they are determining how blessed they are by what you have. I mean, people come to me and ask me, the first question, oh, you're a pastor. The second question, can you guess what they ask me? A wild guess, take a wild guess. No, how many people come to your church? <laughs> they want numbers, you know? They want numbers. That's what the world is after. But God is saying, guys, listen to me. You are blessed in the heavenly realms. He's saying, you are equal to me now. That is your position. See, that's where the Pharisees, uh, the, law, uh, the law keepers had problem with Jesus. They were okay with Jesus performing miracles. The minute he said, I am the son of God. He said, how can he? And now God is saying, you are, I, you, I mean, I brought you up. You were dead in your sins. I gave you life. I raised you up with Jesus Christ. I have seated you with them at the right hand of the Father, high above all principalities, all powers, all authority, all dominion, every name that could be named. He's saying that is where you belong. That is where I want you to be. So, things around you could change. It is not the change that determines your position. It is the position that determines your change. That's how God wants you to enjoy life. Amen? Do you get it? It's not the change that determines your position. It is your position that determines your change. It is, imagine this, now you know who you are. You are seated with Christ Jesus with all authority, with all power. I, I mean, over every name that could be named, someone comes and talks to you. Guy, I mean, I tell you, you are inflicted with this sickness, you will die. They come and tell you. Okay, so what should you do? You don't react to that, you respond to that. You don't react in fear, you respond to that. You know who I am? Blessed in the spiritual realm. In the heavenly, I'm, I don't, I don't react, I mean, this doesn't affect me, this impacts me. Your report doesn't affect me, it is my position that, that, impacts this.
Amen? You don't, re- you don't react in fear. You don't react. You don't run around crazy. You respond by believing who you are and the righteousness of God. Amen? I have the life of God in me. I have the strength of God in me. I have the power of God in me. I have the health of God in me. I have the wisdom of God in me. I have the goodness of God in me. And you stand there. You believe it. You endorse it. You acknowledge it. Then what happens? It changes things around you. Just like how Obed Adam's house changed, it will change everything around you. That's why God said, enough of the, all these things, you know. You will multiply, you will abound and all of that. No. It is who you are that determines what you could have. Said, in the spiritual realm. So from now on, walk like this. I'm blessed in the spiritual realm. Amen. I'm blessed in the heavenly realm. I'm above. No, that's why Paul was able to say, we are, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. I'm in this world. But the way I run my life, it's not based on the things of the world, but it is based on the things of God. Isn't it nice? Right? It is so easy to talk, eh? <laughs> but you, you need to start believing. That's why faith is. It's not what you could have. It is who you are. That's why faith should be on who you are, not on what you want to have. God, th- I'm, I'm believing for one lakh. No, no, no. You believe who you are, so you could have. <laughs> Amen. So, and he's saying, faith, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. What blessings are given? Spiritual blessing. You know why spiritual blessing? It is a spirit that gives life. So the blessing you need to have should be spiritual. The things of the world will go. I mean, the psalmist is writing, the horses are made ready for the battle, but victory... See, that's the things of the world. Do not have your fa- uh, do not trust in man whose breath is in his nostril. That is, that is the, I mean, that is what human beings are. But what you have, it is not of the world, it is from there. Spiritual blessing. And that's what we are going to talk about. What, are the, what is the implication of the spiritual blessing? Then he's explaining it. I mean, you don't need to go anywhere. It is there. Verse 4, he's saying, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless. See, this is the the biggest problem for any human being. I think even for pastors. Sometimes the biggest doubt we have is, am I righteous? (laughs) And here he is saying, he chose us in him. In who? See, I already told you, we are in the Ark of the Covenant. That is Jesus Christ. He chose us. In Christ Jesus. He didn't choose because, you know, because you did something right. He chose in them. Just like Obed Adam. He didn't know who he was. I mean, we don't know his background. But there was a choice that was made. He had to say, yes, today God had made the choice over you. Amen. He chose us in Christ Jesus to be holy and blameless in his sight. You are holy and blameless. I mean, you need to say an amen to that. If you don't believe it, say an amen. Still say an amen. Because that is the truth about you. You are holy and blameless. You are. To be holy and that is how God has designed you to be. You are holy and blameless in Christ Jesus. Isn't it beautiful? How ugly sometimes we feel because of the things we do. But it's because we always determine how holy we are, how blameless we are by the, mo- by the standards of the world. The standards of the world always looks at through, m- through moral standards. But God looks us through legal rights that he has given you. And these moral standards, I mean, given to us, sometimes makes us feel so ugly. And we are so ashamed. And we accept that, we endorse it, and then we run away from God. He is a holy God. 
I'm not holy. He's a good God. I'm not good. Let me run away from him. We are hiding. You know, we are hiding behind good deeds. We are trying to cover it up, saying if I do this, probably I'll feel good. No, you will never get the, to that place of holy and blameless by doing right. You will get to that place by acknowledging it, saying amen to it, by believing in it day in and day out. Accept it. You are holy and blameless. You might be scratching your head. If only he knew. <laughs> you know why God could boldly say you're holy and blameless? He didn't choose because of you. He chose you because of Jesus. That's why in, irrespective of where you have been, what you've done, he can still look at you and say, you are holy and blameless. Let me show you, you know, a few things that helps us in the... I mean, what, are the, what is the implication of this holiness and blameless, uh, blamelessness that has been given to us? Turn with me to Isaiah 15, 7, 8, and 9. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. Who is helping you now? Because who is helping you? The sovereign Lord helps me. I will not be disgraced. Obetadam wasn't disgraced. Amen. You will not be disgraced. And why? Verse 8. I mean, this is very powerful. He who vindicates me is. Who is near you? That's why I said the blessings we have, it is in the heavenly realm. <laughs> Isn't it exciting to know? Your vindicator, he brought you, I mean, he said, no, you come, be equal to me. Sit with me. Dine with me. Sup with me. And I will vindicate you. He's your vindicator. Wherever you go, he vindicates you. People can have opinions about you. He will vindicate you. He'll say, I have made him holy and blameless. He's near you. Don't be afraid to accept this truth. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? That's the boldness you and I need to have. What on earth can you tell me now? You think you can prophesy curse over me? You think you can speak negativity upon me? You can speak what you want, but my vindicator is by my side. Amen? Now he can boldly say, who can will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. Now he can boldly go and say, are you accusing me? No, when you say accusing, it is not only saying, you know, oh, oh, you've done something wrong. It is also deeming you to be unfit. Telling you, you are not fit. I mean, when a doctor calls you and tells you you are sick, you are saying you are unfit. You can go and declare it. I have a vindicator. Amen. And the next verse says, it is a sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he that will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. <laughs> who will wear out? Those who accuse me. No, I'm not talking about people. Yeah, no, you don't want your neighbors to be eaten up like a moth. Do you? You don't want them. You want them to be alive. You know, it's, it's all those things that they bring against you. It's all the opinions. It is all the report. It is all the results that you see. It is all the happenings. You know, you can look at them and say, are you trying to accuse me? Are you trying to tell me I'm not good enough? Let me tell you something about me. I am holy and blameless in God's eyes. It is He who vindicates me. It is in Him I'm blessed with every spiritual blessing. I am not, in the, I'm not of this world. I am in this world, but I'm of 
that world which is above, which fills everything in this world. And you cannot stop me from progressing, from being promoted, from having good health, from having good things happening to me. And all of you talking against me, who are you? You are an old garment. You won't celebrate an old garment, right? And the older it gets, the moth will eat it. So you need to let go of all these accusations. Let them go. Let them go. They will be eaten up. That's what they are fit for. But what are you fit for? To have changes happening in your life. That is blessing. Good things happening around you. Expected things happening around you. Let me show you a few more verses. Romans chapter 8. We'll read from 31. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be? Who is for you now? God is on your side. I mean, we are near to him. He's your vindicator. Who can be against us? And he's saying, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? How will he get all things? Graciously. Okay, verse 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. What is he also doing for you? Interceding. He's not condemning you. He's justifying you. I mean, that's what it says, right? It is God who justifies. Because of Jesus, you stand justified. See, that's why I said your righteousness should be looked through as legal rights, not as right and wrong. You know, it is uh, a judge sitting on his chair with, what do you call it, that pummel? Yeah. And banging on it and saying, you are acquitted. He's justifying you to go and live life. That's what God is doing over you day in and day out. Holy and blameless means that's what it is. Justify it through the mallet saying, Ta! he's whacking it every day, whacking upon you, you know. You are justified. Justified to be healthy. Justified to prosper. Justified to increase. Justified to have right things happening around you. Justified to see the expectations of your heart given to you. Justified. That's what holy and blameless, that is a spiritual blessing that has been given to you. So it is what you are determines what you will have now. Amen. Let's get back to Ephesians again. Let's continue. Fifth verse. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Now who we are? In him we are predestined to be adopted as his Sons through Jesus Christ. See, um, what significance does it make to be called as his sons? It has lots of significance. You know, Adam could never call him Abba Father. Do you know that? He didn't call him. You don't see Adam calling him Abba Father. He didn't call him. He said, I'm afraid of you, God. He ran away from him. Abraham. You thought Abraham could? No. Even he couldn't. Moses saw him face to face. He didn't call him. David didn't call him Abba Father. But for you and me, the Bible says, we have been given the rights to be, to call him Abba Father. What significance does it have? Let me explain. See, I can stand here and say, you are all my spiritual children. I'm your spiritual father. I think. I can say that. So does that mean you come to me and tell me, okay, you said I'm your child, we are your children and you are our father. Now write all that you have to me. <laughs> you think you can do that? No, it is said. I'll be a father to you, you know. I'll come and take the place of your father. I will advise you, you know, give you that embrace or give you that guidance or stand with you. That's what I'm saying. But where is Titus? He's legally my son. Last night, my daughter woke me up at 10, I mean 9.30, 10. I'm hungry, go buy pizza. 
I have no other job. I'm preparing. I'm getting ready for service. He doesn't care. You get ready for service. You have money. You don't have money. So I said, I've exhausted all the money for the week. No more spending for you. Where did you exhaust it? <laughs> See, why? She is my The rights, the legal rights. See, she has that. I mean, that's what God is giving you, saying. When he's telling you, I have adopted you as a son. He said, I didn't adopt you as my children. Sons. He can run into his office. So, I mean, let me show you the implication of it. One more thing. Okay, turn with me to Galatians chapter 3, 26 onwards we'll read. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You are all? Who are you? Sons of God. Do you believe that? Amen. I'm glad you're believing. Better belief. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For you all, you are all one in Christ Jesus. Okay, now it says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What are you now? Heirs according to the promise. What belongs to God belongs to you. It belongs to you. I mean, exciting thing. What belongs to God belongs to you. That's what he's saying. I have. That's for you. That's why he's saying, you know, this is the implication of that word spiritual blessing. Holy, blameless, you are sons of God. Can we move on? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. It says, in him we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of God's grace. In him, we have redemption. That means there is no power in this world that can hold you back. Amen. There is no power in this world. People can say they are great they are doing this against you. I mean, I recently saw a small kid being taught to pray in Tamil. Okay? And what is a kid praying? Andavare! Billy Suniyatanan, Vudaikiren! Billy Suniyam in the Mordaikirangna. Billy Suniyam, witchcraft. See, what has been uh, uh, taught to them? Fear. Fear is being taught to them. See, you don't need to go on binding. When you know who you are. There is no power. Redemption through his blood. I mean there is nothing that can hold you back. That's what he's saying. Through my blood you are. There is. I mean there is no power against the blood of Jesus Christ. He's saying. Redemption. You are redeemed forever. You are redeemed. I mean how many times have I messed up? You don't know, I know. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> and how many times have you messed up? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> now I'll have to have a chat with you to find out what you know. <laughs> no, what I'm trying to say is we know where we were, right? But still we are enjoying God. That's redemption. That is redemption. Amen. We are redeemed. We are redeemed. There is no power that can hold us back anymore. Why? It is us. In accordance with the riches of God's grace. Not because we are right. According to the riches of His grace. You know, people are saying, these people are talking hyper grace. This word is hyper only. God had to be so hyper to tell me, I know what you've done, but still come back. You know, talking about the prodigal son, let me finish, you know, redemption and son, let me finish with that. Talking about the prodigal son. I mean, he messed up big time. And he should actually be a servant. I mean, according to him, that's what he felt. You know, 
I'm not fit to be called your son. Please accept me as your servant. That is his mindset. Okay? But that is not father's mindset. Father still saw him as a son. Amen. And said, all I have is yours. Bring the best of mine. See, that is redemption, you know. Then not even you can stop yourself. Not even you can imprison yourself. That is the power of his redemption over your life. Amen. This is how we are in Christ Jesus, in the R. So if you could accept this, I mean, that's my challenge for you. If you could accept this, if you could say an amen to this, just like how Obit Adam saw things changing around him, I am challenging you. You will see things changing. You now the enemy, you know what is his trick? He doesn't come and allure you. He won't come and present a beautiful temptation before you. He won't do that. He will blind your mind. He will blind your mind to the truth. That's why it says, no? The, he blinds the minds of the, un I mean, unbelievers. We immediately think people outside. No. It is an unbelieving mind. The children of Israel, they saw the promised land, but their mind was blinded to not believe that it is for them. Goodness is for them. You know, the promised land is for them. That's what it is. You know, the minute we start believing this, accepting this, I am holy and blameless. When you wake up in the morning, don't go by feelings, you know, how you feel, how you, you know, sense yourself that day. Go by the truth. I'm a son of God. No more children, you know. Don't call yourself, I'm, the, I'm God's child. Son. Name it. Declare your rights. Amen. I'm a son. I'm a daughter, right? I am redeemed. There's no power. I mean, he can be superior to me. He can have all that he could. He can be well connected, but I am the redeemed of the Lord. Amen. And he can get up and say, holy and blameless. I am blessed in the heavenly realm. In the Tamil, he can say it very good in Tamil. Levele vara. You know, we are at a different level. We are a level. Amen. I am telling you, by the, by the end of this year, before this year could end, you will come back to the same place to testify things change. Amen. When you accept who you are, it will have an impact in the way things happen around you. Just like how obeyed him and no man who knew, I mean who was not known to anyone till the day in the three months I mean I'm telling you in three months in three months I'm challenging you people will come and ask you what did you do you can say I didn't do anything I believed right <laughs> amen can we stand to our feet a gracious heavenly father just like I declare today I pray and I bless them that they will receive this word and bear fruit according to the power of this word. I speak peace. I speak health and wealth over each and every one. Healing that comes because a son of righteousness is risen upon us. They will experience it. When they come back next week, I pray they will come back with testimonies of your goodness. Be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen.